Hello everyone and welcome to Kindred Spirits, Family and Belonging in the Queer Novel with Patrick Gale, um, SJ Sindhu um, and uh, Kerry Andrew. Um, uh, the warmest welcome. Uh, my name is Uli and uh, I work at Gaze the Word Bookshop. Um, uh, I can't wait for tonight's discussion, um, but before we uh, meet the novelists, um, I just have to do a little bit of housekeeping on behalf of the British Library. So welcome to the event, which is a partnership between Gaze the Word and the BL. Um, it's an evening of readings, conversations about childhood, family and identity with our special panelists. Um, we'll be taking questions later on and you can submit your questions to the panelists and to me if you like using the question box below the video here. Um, and a selection of your questions we put to the panelists. I'll do another call out for those a little bit later on in the event. Um, use the tabs above the video <laughs> to uh, provide the British Library with any feedback on their cultural events program and to donate to the library should you wish to. You can also buy copies of the author's book and uh, uh, I would strongly uh, recommend you buy each of these books uh, because they're all incredible and fantastic. Um, uh, from Gaze the Word um, using the link above the video um, and they're also available from uh, all good bookshops. Um, unfortunately, um, and I am sorry about this, due to a technical issue, we are not able to provide uh, speak to text captioning during this event. Um, I do sincerely apologize for that for anybody who is expecting it. Um, so, as I said, my name is Uli, and I'm uh, beaming to you from uh, the uh, salubrious environment of uh, Stockwell in London. Um, uh, my pronouns are he, him, um, um, and um, I just want to pitch in with the, the rest of the panel and say hello, um, beginning with you, Patrick. Patrick, how are you doing? Where are, you, uh, where are we seeing you from today, Patrick? Um, well, I'm at home. I'm in my writing shed out in the garden. So this is the Richard and Judy shed. And it is um, situated very near Land's End, at the very tip of Cornwall. And uh, and what, what have you been doing today, Patrick? Have you, have oh, you I have been I have been frantically finishing the programming of the North Cornwall Book Festival, which I I help put together every year. And uh, I've been cursing writers who hide away and don't reply to emails. <laughs> <laughs> and you've recently been at the Faversham Literary Festival. Were you, were you I have. Festival? Yes, yes. I, I had the big excitement of travelling to Faversham from Cornwall uh, the day after, or the day of the great storm. So um, at every turn I was being told, you shouldn't be travelling. And it took me 12 and a half hours, I think, to get there. But it was worth it. Well, I'm so pleased you're here with us this evening. I can't wait to talk to you more about your amazing novel. Um, uh, Kerry, had, um, Kerry uh, uh, Andrew, um, uh, welcome. It's so lovely to uh, to see oh, you. Where, oh, where are you beaming to? I think we might have lost Uli. Hello. Where are you? To Hello, Uli. I'm not far from you. I'm in Denmark Hill in South London, um, so not very far at all. And I'm just on my in my my writing room, uh, my study. Um, I live on the fifth floor, uh, the top floor on a hill looking to London. So I'm very, very lucky. I get really big skies and can see the weather coming. So today, uh, this afternoon, I had a single bolt of lightning, a single thunderclap, very loud, and then two minutes of insane hailstorm. And then it was sunny again. So, you know, I see it all here. <laughs> it's been a bit schizophrenic today. T tell us a little bit about the objects around you uh, in, in the room, maybe the bird, uh, the bird drawing oh. behind you, but what's that? Well, I like to just surround myself with wildlife. It just makes me feel, uh, I don't know, comfortable. So I've always really liked birds. I'm a very big fan of foxes. Uh, what's that? That's a lovely piece of artwork that's um, also the cover to, used as the cover in a, a lovely Penguin Classics edition of a Sylvia Townsend Warner novel. And then up there is sort of a hint of my other life as a musician and a big influence of mine, Meredith Monk, who's an amazing uh, American composer. Yeah. Fantastic. I, I recognise the Sylvia Townsend, now you've pointed it out. Um, and, uh, and going slightly further afield, um, SJ Sindhu, um, uh, welcome. Where, where are you uh, right now? I am in Toronto, so I'm in a neighbourhood called East York, which is just east of downtown. So if you hear sirens going by, it's because I'm on a main main street, and that's why I'm muting myself when I'm not talking. <laughs> <laughs> and, and you teach creative writing there, is that correct? I do at the University of Toronto. 
Fantastic. And are you, are you teaching at the moment? Um, have you been doing that? Uh, uh, no, we're on reading week. So I'm actually, uh, uh, you know, not teaching this week, but somehow today is still completely full of things. Uh, and I don't know how it got that way. Fantastic. Um, and, and is that the room you, you write in? Do you, or um, is that a separate? It is. Space? Yeah, this is the sort of the writing office I share with my partner. Um, and we, you know, the, de the other desk is right there and we write side by side. Fantastic. And, That's uh, completely and, terrifying. <laughs> 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 Most people respond that way, actually. <laughs> um, okay, so um, SJ, um, uh, if you're happy to, um, uh, we're going to uh, um, start with Blue Skin Gods um, and yeah. uh, talk in a little bit more detail um, uh, about it. Um, I know you're going to read, um, but before you do, um, um, uh, let's just open up the book uh, slightly. Um, it's set in Tamil Nadu. Um, wh wh whereabouts is this in India? Uh, it's sort of the southeastern sort of tip of India. Cool. And, uh, and, and at what point in time does the novel open? Because there's a sort of sense uh, of when it, Yeah, when it opens, it's about uh, mid-90s or so. Okay. So Kalki, the, the main character, is 10 years old. Um, and... and you know, it would be yeah, mid to late nineties when it when it starts and then tracks um, all the way up to the early two thousands. Okay, so so uh, Kalki, um, uh, let, let's talk about um, him in slightly more detail. As you say, he's um, nine, just about to turn ten when the book's mm -hmm. open. Could, could you paint a picture for of this young, unique, extraordinary boy for us? Yeah, uh, Kalki is a young boy who is sort of nerdy, very shy, um, and yet he has blue skin and he is believed to be the last incarnation of the Hindu god Vishnu. And he's believed to have healing powers. So he lives at this ashram that his father has started in rural Tamil Nadu. And um, he, you know, the villagers come to him for healing and he heals them. And on the eve of his 10th birthday, he is supposed to start um, his trials as a child god. So he has three trials um, that he's supposed to pass to prove himself. And he's, you know, that, that's kind of how the, the, the book starts um, with him very nervous about, you know, performing well in these trials. Um, and uh, and pretty soon we uh, we meet uh, Kalki's parents. So um, uh, first of all, maybe let's talk a lot a little bit about his father. Um, and if I'm pronouncing any names, please uh, do correct me. <laughs> his father is called Aya. Is that correct? Aya. Aya. Yeah. His um, so he, Aya is extremely strict. Um, controls every aspect of Kalki's life. Very. It's very regimented. It's much more regimented than you know, most childhoods are. And um, Aya is very concerned about Kalki passing these trials, even more so than Kalki himself, because um, there is a there is an aspect Aya that's that's sort of sinister and villainous. Uh, and and um, at the same time that, you know, Kalki cares a lot about pleasing his father. Uh, his father is also a, a, a very sort of strict, stern, controlling figure in his life. Yeah, it's certainly a, a very uh, dominant force uh, in the book, um, uh, which we'll uh, come to a bit later. And then uh, there's Kalki's mother, Amma. Is that how you say it? Amma. Amma. Tell, paint a picture for us of Amma. So with Amma, I, I mean, she is um, a very gentle, sort of nurturing soul, uh, much younger than Kalki's father. Um, she's his second wife. So, you know, she's, she's also walking in the shadow of um, his first wife who died. And, and she's, she's an artist, she paints, um, she's sort of at odds with this, uh, with the surrounding of the ashram um, because she's a sort of bohemian, you know, left, left to her own devices. I imagine her more as a sort of bohemian uh, figure, but, um, but she's still being controlled by Kalki's father and, and um, living inside the strictures of the ashram and, and uh, throughout the course of the book we sort of see the toll that that starts to take on her mental health. And, uh, and the last character that we'll just um, uh, explore slightly before you read is uh, Lakshman, is that how you say? Lakshman. Lakshman, thank you. Um, yeah. So, uh, so Lakshman is, uh, is a, a little around the same age as Kalki. Mm -hmm. 
Um, yeah, Lakshman is uh, Kalki's cousin and his best friend, the, the person um, around whom the first part of the novel re revolves, um, this, this relationship between Kalki and Lakshman. And Lakshman um, is, is, you know, sort of outspoken and, and charming and in a lot of ways much more suited to the life or, or uh, a presentation of a child god than Kalki is. Um, but Lakshman is normal, right? He doesn't have blue skin. He is, you know, he doesn't have healing powers. And, um, and so there's this, uh, there's all, you know, they're best friends and there's a lot of love and camaraderie, but there's also this sort of competition that exists between the boys. Um, and Lakshman's always pushing Kalki's boundaries and, and uh, sometimes lashing out because he's so frustrated that Kalki's getting all the attention. Are you happy for me to invite you to read a little bit from the uh, yes. beginning of the novel? Yeah, I've never actually read from the UK edition. I've been reading from the, the US. This is my re normal reading copy, so this is exciting. Okay, I'm just gonna read from the very, very beginning. And this is, this is uh, actually, it takes place 10 years um, after, before the rest of the novel, or sorry, after the best rest of the novel. The driver slammed the brakes, whipping my head forward and back. A chorus of honks crescendoed in the muggy New Delhi night. A few cars ahead, in the middle of an intersection, an auto rickshaw lay on its side, its three wheels still spinning, the metal poles of its sides cracked in half. Tire tracks swirled into a small blue car with its front end smashed. Glass littered the road, glittering pinpricks of light. People surged around us. My father, Aya, opened the door of the taxi and we pushed our way into the crowd. Aya weaved to the front. I walked in his wake. An older woman was sprawled on the ground next to the auto, thrown out as it tipped over. The auto driver was on his back near her. His eyes stared right up at the sky. Red slashes glistened over their bodies. People shouted in Hindi to call the police, call the ambulance. The woman was still breathing. Two men tried to lift her. Stop, Aya said. He raised his voice and yelled, stop. You could make her injuries worse if you move her. He pushed his way into the clearing. I followed out of instinct, as if we had a string tied between us. I'm a doctor, he said, let me look. The men put her limbs back down. Aya crouched over the woman. He opened her eyes and checked her pulse. She's losing a lot of blood, he said. She needs help or she won't last. Look, someone said, Kalkisami can heal her. A man pointed in my direction. I wondered if he'd been at my prayer meeting earlier or if I'd healed him before. A hundred eyes turned toward me. Yes, Kalkisami, another man said. You can heal her. I walked toward the injured woman and knelt near Aya. Up close, the overpowering smell of iron and urine and so much blood, cavernous slashes in their bodies. I put my shaking hands over the woman's head where a pool of blood grew on the asphalt. I chanted over and over, my lips quivering with the words, Om Shri Ram, Om Shri Ram, Om Shri Ram. Some of the crowd prayed with me. I closed my eyes against the lights. I chanted and chanted, Om Shri Ram. Two, 12 years earlier, a girl named Rupa arrived at our ashram in Tamil Nadu, India, dying from a sickness only I could cure. This, my father told me, would be my first miracle. It was the eve of my birthday, an important transition. I was the 10th human incarnation of the Hindu god Vishnu, and I was turning 10 years old. Like every Friday, the villagers filtered in with rice and lentils, fresh milk from their cows, spinach, moringa, and bitter gourd from their gardens. They put these gifts in front of me as I sat on the only pillow in the room, 
and they took their seats on the bed sheets we'd laid over the cement floor. My father, Aya, sat to my left and my cousin Lakshman to my right. We faced the open green door that led to the veranda. The village kids played outside. As a birthday treat, Aya had promised to let us play with them after the prayer session, if Lakshman and I were well behaved and lucky. My mother had wanted to have an eggless cake made to celebrate with the villagers, but Aya thought it too Western and decadent. One of the village kids had brought a cricket bat for the first time, and he showed it to the others, beaming as they touched it, demonstrating how to hit the ball. I'd asked my parents for a cricket bat for my birthday. I imagined holding it, showing it off to the boys when they came for next week's prayer meeting. Aya nudged me with his elbow and I snapped back to attention. Ashamed, I'd let myself be distracted. Now was not the time for cricket fantasies. Now was the time to focus and prove myself in whatever test would be demanded of me that night. The Sri Kalki Purana, the Hindu text that prophesied my birth and life, said it was on my 10th birthday that my trials as a living God would begin. I would be tested three times and I would have to prove myself worthy of my birth. Aya had reminded me of the scripture that morning. I saw a vision, he had said after our morning meditation. I had seen a vision too, early with the sunrise. I had woken up dreaming of goat blood. In the dream, I'd wrapped my hands around the neck of a month old kid and held tight as it thrashed, then stilled. I'd put my hands through its skin and felt its insides. I had smeared the gummy blood on my face, my chest, my feet, until my skin prickled and grew fur and my nails knit together into hooves, until I was the goat. But I was afraid to tell Aya about this dream, afraid my vision meant doom. Thank you. Thank you so much. That was amazing. Thank you. Um, in that reading, we really get a glimpse of this this pull, this dichotomy between um, wanting to be a a boy, a young child, and this weight, this burden of expectation um, that rests on Kalki's shoulders. Um, at one point, uh, there is a the line in the novel, um, "Gods don't cry." Um, mm -hmm. That that I mean. Childhood's tricky at the best of times, but with the the burden of expectation of kind of um, being seen and, and proving yourself as a living God, um, uh, the pressure is kind of often incalculably burdensome. Um, there's this weird kind of like polarity of kind of the need to appear superior, but also nursing kind of a great insecurity that we get with Kalki. Could you, could you speak a, bit, a little bit about the, that conflict within their childhood? The, the most interesting thing to me about writing this novel, the, the thing that pulled me to it was this uh, conflict between all of the expectation that Kalki is facing as a, as a child who is supposed to be also a god and thus you know, not a child at all, right? He's supposed to act like not even a small adult, but a god, um, somehow above the world of adults even. And his desire to be just a kid. Um, he wants a cricket bat. He wants to play with the village boys. He wants to run around with Lakshman. And yet um, he's the sort of young boy who, who internalizes a lot of these expectations, right? Who wants to, who wants to be a good child god who wants to uh, satisfy the expectations that are that that are put upon him um, so he really feels this sort of pull between these two desires these conflicting desires um, to please his father to please everybody else um, but then also like who is he outside of these expectations so I, I found it really exciting to write about and and um, one of the one of the most beautiful things um, in my experience of writing the novel was sort of tracing how that conflict evolves over the next 10 years of his life. So he starts out when he's 10 or 12 years uh, and the novel ends when he's 22. And, and we see kind of um, how those uh, desires, those conflicting desires evolve over, over a decade. Yeah, very much so. Um, I mean, uh, we, we were 
talking earlier about Aya, um, Akaki's father, um, uh, this controlling figure, and uh, it, th th there's a, a real sense of the to toxicity of that control and the, the casualties of that control. Um, and, and I guess the most kind of like apparent uh, victim of it is the fragmentation of this family set up in the ashram mm -hmm. um, that leads to uh, separations of families, which also kind of incubates this great sense of loss and yearning in Kalki. And th th there's a huge amount of synergy, I thought, between that, that theme in uh, your book and also uh, in Kerry's book, Skin. There's a sense that Kalki very much is left yearning um, uh, mm -hmm. and, and needing and searching. Um, also within Kalki's childhood, there are these kind of threads of kind of queerness or kind of like gender nonconformity that kind of like creep in, which I really like. There's this uh, wonderful scene uh, where he's discovered by his mother, Aya, um, uh, um, exploring her, her clothing, her female attire. Can you, can, can, you, can you speak a little bit about that scene and what happens there? Yeah, in, in the scene, he's talking about, um, he's remembering being small and um, playing with his mother's saris. So he, you know, opens up her armoire and there's all these like beautiful, colorful saris. Um, and he sort of starts out by just like running his fingers on the, on the, on the saris and feeling the texture of them. And eventually he starts taking them out and trying to wrap them around himself and, and trying to sort of inhabit her skin. Um, and I really saw it as, you know, one indicative of uh, of this sort of almost non-binary identity that Kalki has, um, but also his his uh, wanting to be really attached to the one parental figure in his life that he, that is positive, right? He has this really controlling father and this mother who's just you know really loving and 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 um, being also victimized by his father. And I saw that scene as a as um, as a way for him to sort of bring her closer, and she discovers him doing it, and in, and he thinks you know he's going to get uh, uh, um, uh, scolded, but instead she's like, no, let me do it properly, and she actually wraps the sorry the good the right way around him, and she like puts makeup on him, and and um, he gets to sort of feel what it would be like, I think, to not have these expectations. So that's the other side of a patriarchal culture, right? That that yes, women are being controlled, but also men and boys are being controlled and they have this burden of expectation also on them. Um, and I wanted to explore it from the other side because most of my writing has been, you know, very feminist in, in, in sort of exploring it from, from uh, women's perspectives, femme perspectives, feminine perspectives. And, and this was the other side, um, Kalki wanting to reject these patriarchal expectations of himself and, and be free from, uh, free from that. And, and kind of on that theme, can you uh, speak briefly to um, about a character who comes in a little bit later on in the narrative, Kalyani? Um, can you tell us a little bit about them and the community that they belong to in the book? Yeah, so Kalyani um, is, is a Tirunange, which is the Tamil bird um, for a trans woman. And um, she sort of appears, she's around Kalki's age, she appears uh, sort of, you know, midway through the novel, and um, she's really there as as a, as the first person who really sees Kalki, because everyone else is too close to him to really be able to see him fully in the in the cold light of day. But she sees him and she embraces him without expectation, and she that's the first uh, encounter he has with someone who accepts him fully and doesn't have any expectations of him. Um, that he's supposed to perform. And so he develops this friendship with her and eventually develops a crush on her. Um, and, and, you know, he's 10, he's sort of starting to explore his sexuality and, and figure out, you know, uh, and he doesn't really understand what crushes are. He doesn't really understand what this all means. Um, but but I, I just wanted it to be a very pure uh, sort of infatuation that you have as a child. Um, and, and their friendship as unlike, you know, these unlikely underdogs um, was, was really interesting to me. And, and I, I really also, because um, like uh, Tirunar, which is, uh, which means trans, um, 
because the Thirunar community has such a long and deep history in Tamil culture, I also wanted to be true to that and, and accurately uh, or try the best I could to, to create a character um, that sort of accurately portrays um, portrays the community, or at least, uh, you know, you, you can't portray an entire community, but at, uh, at least gets at some sort of authentic heart at, um, at that experience. And so I did have, you know, sensitivity readers and, and, um, and such to make sure that, that I wasn't doing anything uh, off the mark. Um, but it, but Kalyani is, is, I think, my favorite character. She was a, a pleasure to write and she's just so pure. Um, she's so wholesome and pure and their relationship is, is beautiful. Thank, thank you, SJ. I, I um, uh, loved her too. And uh, she she's an interesting almost bridge character to this other kind of like section of the book where the novel transitions to New York and there's this whole different kind of uh, uh, enclave of kind of queerness and identity that Kalki kind of gets to uh, discover. Thank you so much for opening up the book for us a little bit more. We'll come back and, uh, and talk in a little bit more detail. Um, but uh, now we're gonna go from India to, uh, to Gold is Green. Um, and uh, we're gonna go to Skin um, uh, with you, Kerry. Um, so the, 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 uh, your novel opens uh, in Golders Green in 1985, um, and uh, we meet uh, Matty, who is just a year older than Kalki, um, 11 years old. Um, uh, tell us a little bit about Matty. Sure. Um, well, I'll say that the, the book is in two main halves, and each half is, uh, uh, takes place over six weeks. Um, and in 1985, it's six weeks um, between the end of primary school and the beginning of secondary school uh, in the UK. Um, and a lot happens in that time, but I feel that that's a real, you know, it's a big moment for any child who, who goes through that process at that age um, of suddenly being uh, at the top and then suddenly being at the bottom and feeling quite small. Um, in the very beginning of the book, this is no spoiler to say this, um, Matty's dad, who's called Joe, goes missing. That's the first sentence. Um, and the first, well, the whole book really is about Matty trying to work out what has happened to him and get some answers. Um, the last place that Joe was seen was Hampstead Men's Pond in North London, very close to Golders Green. Um, and this is something of a surprise to Matty and Matty's mum, Rosa, who didn't know that Joe went swimming there. Um, but this is just sort of the beginning of the mystery for Matty. And so Matty in, in the first part of the book um, goes to Hampstead Heath and the, and the men's pond um, and manages to get into the men's pond as a child and swim there and is introduced to this world of wild, wildish, it's London, uh, outdoor water. Um, that is a, a really key relationship for Matty throughout the whole book. Uh, Kerry, on that note, would you, uh, would you just the honor of reading? Sure thing. I'm going to read a bit I haven't read before um, and it's got an, a lifeguard who Matty thinks is Australian but is actually South African and I can't do that accent so I'm just going to you know use my normal accent for that. Um, Matty has been to the ponds once and this is a scene quite near the beginning of the book in which Matty is trying to get a little bit closer but is also wondering you know did, did Joe drown in this pond what has, what has happened and also makes a new friend. Um, the lifeguard looked down at Matty, frowning, as if no one was allowed to stand on this part of the platform except him. Today, his sunglasses were pushed up on top of his head, and you could see the thin lines at the corners of his eyes. Another lifeguard, much older, was sitting on a chair, hands clasped over his stomach, gazing outwards. No church again. Mama mostly stayed in bed, like John Lennon and Yoko Ono when they had all the journalists and photographers in there. She had taken the plate of toast that Matty brought in without interest and put it on the bedside table. Maybe it was less like John and Yoko and more like the prisoners who went on hunger strike in Northern Ireland. Do you know Joe Ronan? Matty said to the lifeguard, arms tightly crossed. Who's that? Joseph. Ronan. He hated being called Joseph. Mama would call him Joseph Ronan when they were arguing and Dad would close his eyes before looking at the ceiling. He comes... He came swimming here. Uh-huh, the lifeguard said. Look around you. Quite a lot of fellas swim here. That's the idea. Yeah, but he drowned in here. You missed him. Lungs letting water in bit by bit. 
It was the last place he was seen. He glanced down. Are you talking about the missing guy? Do me a favour. We've already had the police around here. How do you know about that? Matty shrugged. Did they search for him? No, they just came and asked questions. He looked down at Matty quite frankly. They didn't go and look in the water. Sometimes police sent divers down on searches, wetsuits and flippers and masks. Bodies float, body boy. Not always. Sometimes they took ages, like Virginia Woolf, the writer in the encyclopedia. She wasn't found for three weeks. People had not been found for years, another book had said, and their bodies turned to candle wax because of a lack of oxygen. Sometimes you have to dredge the bottom. The lifeguard looked irritable. Look, we had a drowning in here two years ago. Davy never got over it. Never lifeguarded again. I don't want to be reminded of it, all right? He narrowed his eyes, and he bloody floated. An impatient, slightly suspicious glance. What's it all to you? Yesterday, Matty had pretended that the man with the balding head and bright purple trunks was dad. Just interested? The lifeguard folded his arms so that you could see the veins on his biceps. All right, Detective Sergeant Pipsqueak. Either get in that water or bugger off. Where's your dad today? Matty put a flat hand against both eyebrows and squinted about. Around. He sighed. In you go then. Don't drown. It was earlier in the day than last time and not busy. The sun was hot when the clouds went over it. An old man with a droopy Wild West moustache was doing breaststroke very slowly and a couple of younger men were diving, their stomachs sucked in as their arms stretched up. Two swimmers hugged close to the rope markers doing front crawl, their mouths opening and closing like goldfish. Matty swam slowly to the middle of the pond, heading for the floating platform. Try to imagine Dad in here, tired after work, having had a pint or two in the pub first and maybe gone a bit thin lizzy, like he sometimes said. No one was on the platform today. You'd be easily missed here in the water on the far side of it. The lifeguards hardly seemed to watch half the time, chatting to each other, caps pulled down low. Matty turned over and floated face up, arms out flat and eyes closed, the sun beating down. Lungs like inflatables. Breathe in and you rose. Out and you sank just a little, like Dad might have done. Time to stop breathing. Arms sagged. Legs. A line of cool liquid rose slowly into each ear. The water rocked, a queasy sway, and Matty's body was lulled 180 degrees round, face in the pond. Drowning. It would be like dreaming. Suddenly a hand was dragging Matty back round and yanking a fist's worth of t-shirt. Cough, snot, cough. Matty fumbled, holding onto someone's bare shoulders, kicking, blinking madly. Two dark eyes right there. What in the bleeding hell do you think you're doing, dickhead? There was a loud whistle blown from the lifeguard's area. Matty stopped kicking, partly held by the boy, and gazed back. Heart full of water, lungs full of air. Are you dead? No. The boy prodded Matty in the chest. Out. Up. His face was very close. Still coughing, Matty had clambered up onto the central platform and now sat exhausted as if having just run the London Marathon. The boy from the water was peering fiercely about two inches away. Slick dark hair, his eyes so bog brown that they were almost black. He sat back on his haunches, running a palm over his hair and waggling the water off, droplets that caught the light. His shape seemed liquid, his skin lined in sun. Balancing on his heels, the boy clasped his hands in front of him and let out a breath, a really annoyed breath. Seriously, you're a dickhead. There seemed to be nothing to say. You couldn't thank someone who had rescued you from drowning when you had been half trying to drown. Shivers started coming, a head rush. Matty jumped back in and swam very fast toward the walkway. Short, shallow breaths. Where are you going? The boy's voice was flung into the air but he didn't follow. Thanks. Thank you, Kerry. Uh, that was fantastic. Um, so yeah, there we, we see Matty at the Hampstead Ponds and he, he really goes there because he's picked up from uh, an interview with a police officer that um, that's where his missing father used to spend time, which is a bit, a bit and the, the, the element of, of mystery uh, around that. And, and, but it's Matty's only clue to what, what's happened to his father. And, uh, and it, as he starts to attend the men's ponds and then the other ponds, the secret ponds that you're not, not meant to, to swim in, 
he's very much trying to rationalize this very adult problem from, from a child's perspective, I thought. And there's this heady mix of kind of childhood invention, um, possibility, threads of reading that Matty's been doing uh, in the, the library um, and, and different things. How, how was it concocting the rationalization of, of a child trying to work to, to process this, this very adult problem? I think, I think that children tell themselves stories. I, I was thinking about this, particularly with reading SJ's book. They tell themselves stories to preserve themselves as best as they can and protect themselves as much as they are able with the information they're given, which is almost always not the whole truth. Um, yeah, I had fun. Uh, I mean, some of it was instinctive. You know, I had fun sort of imagining a child thinking about really, you know, sort of imaginative things happening to Joe, like being abducted by aliens or something to do with the mafia or the KJB, um, you know, lots of things like that. But what, what was interesting to me was, yeah, the imagination of a child and how in the second part of the book, when we see Matty as a, a youngish adult, age 25, that a lot of that imagination has kind of gone. Um, it's actually represented in another character who comes in towards the end of the book, a, a child character. Um, and so I suppose I was just interested in um, the fantastic, broad, incredibly broad um, imagination that often the child has that can sometimes just get a bit kind of beaten down with life, with all sorts of things, you know, not just a sort of difficult childhood, but just the way that, that a lot of children are brought up and educated. So I thought that sort of journey was, was an interesting one to look into. Absolutely. The, the, their mind is kind of alive with these different kind of threads. There's, the, there's, there's threads of mythology. Um, they've been reading about Ophelia. They've been reading about Houdini. They've been reading about Chinese water spirits. So there's this different fusion of, of different ideas going through their mind and and then but beyond that they they, they kind of encounter a a logical family of sorts at the hamster ponds um, uh, they meet the, they meet the characters Daz, Daz and Getty for example T tell us a little bit about the community um, that they, uh, that, they, they, they that Matty, Matty meets at the pond. Well, this was very imagined. Um, I, I've, I'm not allowed to go to the men's pond, so I really just tried to imagine and read up as much as I could on on the community in the 80s. You know, it was it was very popular with the gay community, the gay male community, the men's pond, but not exclusively. I, I did chat to a, a, a straight guy who who was I don't know in his 50s or 60s now who uh, was a regular at the pond, so he was a bit of inside information for me there. But it. I, I am party to other swimming communities. I used to swim. I've been ill for quite a long time, so I've been been off off it sadly. But my local uh, Lido, so it's not wild, but it's outside, is Brockwell Lido, and there's such a community there. Um, all these mad swimmers who swim through the the winter, including me. And there's just something. There's a sort of camaraderie that you get. I feel with swimming there's just something about it I don't know I don't know what it is that shared experience that's really interesting um so I don't know I just wanted to represent um yeah there are only two members of, of a large community but they're just very fun and very welcoming and very sweet really um and kind of a bit protective uh, I wanted to you know because this this traumatic thing has happened to Matty which feels very unsafe I wanted that community to feel like quite a safe a safe place for Matty um, uh, the ponds are um, uh, a research project for Matty. Um, uh, they're a support system for Matty, but they're also an escape. They're an escape from home, and they're an escape uh, from from Rosa, um, uh, Matty's mother, who essentially is shutting down um, uh, uh, as a response to the disappearance of her husband, Matty's father, Joe. Um, uh, Rosa uh, has a bit of a fiery Ital Italian temperament. Um, uh, tell us a little bit about um, uh, what happens to Rosa and how Rosa deals with Joe's um, disappearance. Well, we see it through the eyes of Matty, so that's kind of all, all we know. Um, but yes, the idea is that it's very much a shock, that Joe's disappearance is very much a shock to Rosa as well. It's not something that had been very obviously coming. 
Um, and yeah, Rosa does does shut down um, and won't really talk to Matty and won't give Matty any sort of comfort actually um, or any sort of possibilities because she doesn't really know either. So she's, I mean, she's really struggling, but it comes out in really challenging ways for her child um, because she can be a bit aggressive and she can't really deal with the way that Matty is as an 11 year old child sort of working themselves out. Um, I, I feel like she's, she's someone who needs to be in control and uh, that, that capability has been taken away from her. And so she's trying to control as much as she can, her own emotions and um, Matty, Matty's looks and lifestyle um, in, in the ways that she can. I mean, yeah, she's, she's a pretty challenging character, but actually I think, I think now I have a lot more love, love for her than maybe I did when I was writing somehow. <laughs> I kind of oscillate between sympathy and finding her a complete monster, <laughs> to be honest with you. I mean, at one point, I mean, let's remember, Matty is grieving and trying to process this incalculable as absence of the father they love. Um, and at one point, Rosa burns Joe's clothes and starts getting rid of Joe's possessions and even tells Matty that Joe is dead. So, I mean, there seems to be trauma on top of kind of trauma going, going on at home. Yeah, trauma on top of tra trauma and different stories, you know, so different sorts of stories are being told. And you know, so Matty, you know, Matty thinks because he's gone, he's something really, really, really awful must have happened. He's got abducted, et cetera, et cetera. He drowned in the ponds. He's obviously died because they had a really close relationship. Where, where on earth has he gone? And eventually Rosa tells sort of tells that story as well because it's an easier story for her to sort of give but it's, it's used as a weapon really as well it's 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 control again it's her way of controlling the narrative um in a way that suits her better as you mentioned earlier it's a it's kind of a a book of two halves and the second half um uh um it's 1999 matty is now 25 years old and uh, it opens in ireland and matty uh, is on a bit of a pilgrimage um, in Ireland we almost I, I kind of think of them as a character um, uh, so Matty is living in their their van which is called Shifty and um, uh, journey around Ireland and um, is tentatively searching uh, for Joe following up leads but um, they're essentially wild swimming their way across um, Ireland um, tell me a little bit about wild swimming and, uh, and water in the book. I'll be frank with you. The reason I wrote this book, um, uh, or what came out, came out is because I wanted to write a book that had lots and lots of swimming in it because that was my complete preoccupation at the time. I was just, you know, it was just my joy is, is and was and is swimming outside, um, both in Lido's and finding rivers and lakes and locks. And I, I just wanted to explore explore writing about it you know that was really it and this story kind of came out of that and when I told my then editor at Jonathan Cape uh, Robin Robertson um, who's retired now uh, that I, I told him about the idea for this book and what the first half was and I said and I want the second half to be somewhere else um, I really like writing about wet green places and he said do you know the the sort of central belt of Ireland and I said no and he said, well, look at that. And I looked at it on the map and it's just these diamonds and diamonds and diamonds of water going all the way up through the island of Ireland um, and then kind of along the border and out to the west. And I was like, oh, I have to have some trips. So I had some trips and some dips where I went swimming, um, swimming in the, I wouldn't really call it swimming, more, more dipping, generally dipping, getting out, writing some notes down, getting changed. <laughs> Um, anyway, so really that's, that's what it was all about, my passion for wild swimming, and then it was sort of poured into this, this character. Um, so really part of the reason is I just wanted an excuse to write about Ireland's water. But I just had this idea that um, Matty uh, has found out just before the beginning of part two, Matty has found out something um, pretty key about Joe and Joe's disappearance that, that leads him to Ireland. Um, but there's a little bit of resistance. There's a lot of fear in finding out, in, in getting possibly quite close to finding out what on earth happened to him. So there's a sort of, there's a propulsion forwards, but there's also the fear and the fear is sort of assuaged 
by swimming a lot. So, okay, well, I'll go and find another lock. Okay, what's on the map? This lock, this lock is really nearby. I'll go and swim there. So water for a lot of the book, but not the entirety, provides a great deal of solace for Matty um, in all sorts of ways. Um, it's just a place of comfort. Uh, it's a place where Matty feels um, most themselves for most of the book. Um, yeah, so that, that was the relationship, I suppose, I, I created with, with Matty and Water. Uh, absolutely. Um, uh, water does seem to be a, a kind of a medium of solace um, uh, for um, a body that is questioned and interrogated uh, publicly. Um, um, uh, there's, um, there's, there's, there's a lot of, as Matty travels around Ireland, um, um, there are voices going on. Partly, they're still in dialogue with the voice of their absent father, Joe. They, they, there's a communication. They, they can hear their, their, fa their father's voice in their head. And at the same time, they're sensitive to memories of taunts at school about their identity and who they are. They're constantly having to navigate um, interrogation disguised as chit-chat about their, their, their gender presentation about who they are. So while swimming is, it, it, it is a kind of an enclave um, for them to feel free, to, 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 to feel at liberty. Um, I, we, we touch on it slightly, but um, um, with regard to water um, uh, um, as maybe being seen as kind of a, a kind of gateway, a gateway to a, a different realm, a sense of comfort, could you talk a little a bit about the influence of folklore and mythology in, in, in the book? Just yeah, we, uh, absolutely. Just, yeah. um, so my my main life and my previous artistic life has been as a musician and composer and uh, also as a, a folk musician. So I've always really loved um, folkloric stories, um, particularly of, of these islands, but elsewhere too. And as I started writing fiction, uh, that just seemed to be my way forward. Um, my first novel explicitly works with a particular folk ballad. And for this, my second novel, for Skin, I wanted to still uh, play with folklore, but in a much freer way. So I knew that I wanted a very watery story. And I just uh, looked up and researched lots of, of water folklore and water mythology, um, especially in Britain and Ireland, but in other parts of the world, certainly as well. And I wrote all this stuff down and then I kind of just let it influence the story. So there are just lots of different, um, different allusions to folkloric stories or, or folkloric characters that you might get in all sorts of different parts of the world um, sort of floating throughout. And as I write in my author's note, it's really true that afterwards I looked at the story and went, oh, actually, there's also that bit. That's a bit like this song I know or this story. So I really like the sort of interplay. It's not just me kind of trying to shoehorn stuff in, but I felt like things were kind of rising up out of the, the story that I was creating and creating these extra layers. Um, there's a particular uh, a story, the Selkie story, Silky story, um, which is a sort of seal person uh, that it's a, a folklore story from Orkney um, that plays a part in the second half of the book. Um, but there's also sort of, yeah, allusions to mermaids or the Irish marrow and water sprites and uh, a water dog and lots of other things as well. <laughs> It's such a fantastic uh, novel, Kerry. Um, I, I, I think you're beginning to realise just how much I uh, loved it. So, uh, so thank you for, for opening it up for us. I, I really appreciate it. Um, so now we're going to move on to uh, you, sir, um, uh, Patrick Gale. Um, and um, I'm going to start with um, uh, my favourite kind of slightly uh, confused question about which number in you in your novel writing career, Mother's Boy is, because um, th there's always a slight element about which, how many novels you've written, isn't there? Oh, yeah. <laughs> I think it's 17, I think. I, I tend to retreat and just talk about how many books, that's easier. Um, the, there are collections of short stories and there's a novella and I don't know. I'm old, I'm just very old, really. <laughs> Leave it at that. Um, very distinguished too. Um, uh, <clears throat> Where did the inspiration uh, for this book come from, Patrick? 
it's based on a real person so it's it's based on the early life of the Cornish poet Charles Causley and his mother and we know quite a lot about Charles and we know very little about his mother Laura so that was my way in and all my novels really um, start with a question I can only answer by writing a novel. Um, you know, a question that can't be answered by straightforward research. And in this case, the, the question really was, why on earth did this poet, Charles Causley, who had all these adventures during the Second World War, why did he choose to come back to this tiny town in Cornwall where he'd grown up? and live with his mother and teach in a little local primary school. Because in many ways, he is the most unromantic of poets. I mean, when, when you say someone's a poet, you immediately think they're a heartbreaker, they're self-destructive, they're suicidal. Charles Corsi has this really, really quiet life. And um, I was determined that there was a volcano there somewhere. And I, in the course of my research, I think I found it. It's described as a novel of Cornwall, but also of two world wars. There, 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 there's a real sweep to this. Yeah. It's, it's miraculously beautifully told, if you don't mind me saying, novel. Um, so um, it sort of uh, opens pre, pre First World War. Um, um, and, and we kind of uh, encounter a world before the character Charles exists, really. So we, we kind of start with Charles, Charles's mother. Um, so tell us a little bit about Laura. So Laura, when we first meet her, is a, a maid in a house in Tinmouth on the South Devon coast. And this is, this is all true. She met Charlie, her future husband, when he was a servant in a, a neighbouring household. He worked for a doctor as a groom. And uh, I have them meeting by accident on the very first page of the book when Charlie, driving the doctor's ca little cart, runs almost runs over a little boy and wounds him and he, they bring him into the house where Laura is working so the doctor can stitch him up um, and her, her eyes meet Charlie's across the child's body and it's the first of many scenes that go into quite gruesome physical detail. I think one of the things all three of our novels have in common is they're in, intensely in the body and of the body and Laura works with her hands. She's, she's a manual labourer by and large. So most of the novel, she is working as a laundress. And I had to do a heck of a lot of research into how the hell you do laundry when you haven't got a washing machine. Um, uh, I can now, I'm now an expert on it. I'm obsessed with stains and how to remove them. Um, well, and I was very, I, I was very moved by the idea that Laura, who is barely literate, um, has this child who is some kind of genius and without giving away too much of the plot um, his father isn't around for long and so she has to raise this child on her own and we're quite used now to the idea of one parent families but back in the 1920s that was a tough thing to be. So, um, so towards the beginning of the novel uh, Charles's father Charlie goes um, off to war um, and Whilst he does return, he returns changed. Um, yes, I mean, I, I hadn't realised until I researched the book that there actually was quite a TB epidemic in the trenches. I should have known this because one of my great aunts was a nurse out there and that was how she died. Um, but a lot of the men who got caught up in the mustard attacks, mustard gas attacks, had their lungs profoundly weakened and then they caught TB all too easily. And Charlie catches TB and is basically sent home to die. So Charles, the hero of the book, only has a father for a very few years. He was only seven when his father died. And again, this is something I think these books have in common. It, it, it's a novel that really explores the, the yearning for a father. And sometimes that slight ambiguity that that then lends to the relationship with the mother. If you if you only want the, the parent who isn't there, what does that do to your relationship with your mother? Uh, absolutely, it's a, it's a, it's a theme across uh, these three fantastic novels. Um, Patrick, would you um, uh, do us the honour of reading for us, please? Of course, I'll, I'll read a bit from very early on. 
um, about about Charles's dad, about Charles and Charlie. Uh, so in this scene, Charles, the little boy, is only five years old, but pretty precocious. He's already learning to read quite well, even though he hasn't started school yet. Um, and he is going on one of his father. His father goes for a daily walk for his TB. Then Charles showed him what he'd been shown by Gwenny and Bridie the other day. There was a statue of Mary Magdalene at the back of the church. And if you could throw a pebble so that it stayed there and didn't just bounce off, you'd get a new suit. It was quite a distance from path to statue and he couldn't make his pebbles get anywhere near. But he knew from their trips to the quieter stretches of the river that father was clever with stones and could make them skip over the water like bouncing balls. Unlike Charles, father wasn't from Launceston, hadn't grown up there, and needed these things explaining to him, just as Gwenny had explained to Charles. Once he understood, he fetched a pebble. So tell me again, he asked, what must I do? You have to stand just here and throw the stone so it lands on Mary Magdalene, it's no good if it just hits and bounces off. It has to stay there. And if it stays, are you in a new suit? Yes, Charles giggled, sensing he was being humoured. And if I knock someone else's pebble off, does their new trousers suddenly disappear? No. So I just throw it so it stays, like this. And he threw a pebble very carefully so that it lodged tightly behind the statue's shoulder with a satisfactory click. Charles clapped. No suit, he said, no suit. Do you want one and all? Yes, all right. And father produced a second stone and tossed it and lodged it as neatly as he had the first. Charles laughed. He felt slightly giddy, like when they'd been on the golden gallopers at the Shrovetide Fair. He began to feel a little nervous as well, in case so much good fortune was not allowed, like taking a second slice of heavy cake before everyone else had eaten the first one. But then father slyly produced a third pebble and raised an eyebrow. What do you think, he asked. Best of three. Would your mother like a new suit? A nice tweed one, maybe. And somehow, the idea came to Charles's mind of mother not wearing the kind of suits ladies wore to church sometimes, with a tweed skirt and matching jacket, but in a man's suit, bulky and baggy, and with a man's hat to match, and a pipe. It was so outrageous a thing to imagine, there in a graveyard, with grown-ups clicking by on their business with baskets and parcels and serious faces, like Aunt Ellen's when someone burped, that Charles laughed so hard he may have wet himself a little. And then father was laughing too, perhaps because Charles laughing was funny, but then he stopped laughing and had to cough. Normally his coughs weren't so bad. He would splutter, tug out the day's handkerchief. Some days he had more than one before bedtime, turn carefully away, cover his mouth, and cough once, three times maybe. But this time he coughed several times, so hard that it must have hurt. Like when Albert from next door had whooping cough and his mother took him to breathe in the gasworks fumes every day to help him get better. Father had to grip a tombstone with one hand, bracing himself as the coughing shook him and a lady made a clucking noise and stepped off the path to avoid them. Charles didn't know where to look. Everyone always looked away from father when he coughed, and he knew it was rude to stare, but it was frightening, and he couldn't look away for long. Finally, the handkerchief was fumbled back into the suit pocket, but not before Charles saw a splash of poppy red on it. And then father had to make a noise, a bit like someone about to be sick, more tutting from passers-by, and made very tidy use of the day's blue Henry. He tucked the little bottle away in his jacket's outer pocket, where mother made him keep it as she was frightened he'd forget it and sit on it if he kept it in his trouser pocket. 
took a few shallow breaths and leaned back against the tomb. He saw Charles and Jack both watching him anxiously and ruffled Charles's hair, which he knew he hated, and whistled to cheer the dog up. Sorry about that, he muttered. We can go on a bit in a moment. Then he just stood there, leaning against the tomb, with his eyes shut for so long, Charles thought he might have fallen asleep standing up. Charles watched people stepping off the path to walk past them. A woman with a lively little dog on a lead that Jack growled at, a man his father's age with a black leather bag, two pretty girls with parcels from the butcher, which were starting to leak blood. Edna, the tramp lady, who lived in a hedge near the baths, of whom mother always said mysteriously, you can tell she's clean underneath. And the vicar. The vicar looked as though he was about to speak to father, then saw his eyes were closed, glanced down at Charles, and visibly swallowed his words like a dry wafer as he walked past instead. Thank you so uh, very much, Patrick. It's, um, it's a joy to hear you read. Um, uh, uh, one thing I, uh, I love about all of your books is, is the tenderness that you have for your characters. And every character, it doesn't matter how central or marginal they are, a, 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 full, a fully rounded person even if they just sort of come in for a scene, you can feel the kind of like the, the life of them, um, uh, even after they've departed the page. So um, and it was a joy to hear you read. Thank you. Um, uh, going back uh, to uh, to Charles's mother, Law Laura, you mentioned that she was a laundry woman. She's she's hardworking. She's resilient. Um, she's kind. She's generous. Um, what particularly motivated you to explore the relationship between a mother and a son in this book? Well, I wanted to write a novel about how Charles Causley became Charles Causley, how he became a poet. And I'm convinced that his mother played a huge role in shaping him. After all, she was pretty much his only parent. Um, and I had to extrapolate her character from his poems. He does little thumbnail sketches and a lot of his poems of boys and girls he knew as a child or his various relatives and his mother I feel is there throughout mainly as his own kind of wisdom that creeps out so in a way Causley's poems helped me to draw Laura but I had to extrapolate quite a bit and I had photographs of her and I find I often use photographs when I'm writing of, of characters they they photographs of people and buildings were real help and I have a particularly wonderful photograph of her when Charles is still a very small baby and she's looking at him with kind of awe in a way as if to say you know what am I going to do now and this very intelligent baby is just gazing out at the world um, and I, I thought there's a, there's a really interesting relationship there. And there, there are a few little hints I picked up about her. One, one which really amazed me was that although she was earning pence, if that, as a laundress, she somehow clawed together enough money to buy her child a piano. And that sounds ordinary enough, but back then this was an amazing deal. I mean, they were, they were living, they weren't in a slum, but they were in a, a tenement, um, where they basically lived in one and a half rooms. And just physically fitting a piano into this place was amazing enough. And then I met an old man who had been a, a younger friend of Charles when they were little, who vividly remembered sitting on the pavement outside the tenement to listen to the piano because none of the children in the street had heard one before. It was the most amazing thing for them. So I thought that that is a really interesting clue as to what Laura's nature must have been like. I think you, you fold in social history, um, uh, sort of uh, issues around class, sacrifice, um, uh, money, privilege, um, and difference really artfully in this uh, book. Um, and uh, Charles is different. Um, uh, he is peculiar um, uh, and unlike his contemporaries. Um, uh, um, could you talk a little bit about his childhood relationship with Joe, who's the son of the butcher, a relationship that doesn't get off to the best start. Yeah, I mean, like a lot of uh, 
the, the elements in this book. Um, Joe is, is sort of lifted straight from Charles's poems. There's a wonderful poem by Charles about basically being beaten up by the butcher's son at, at school. And um, Joe is the butcher's son and he does beat Charles up. He, he gives him a black eye and breaks his glasses. But they go on to form a kind of friendship, largely thanks to Laura, who, to Charles's horror, marches him round to the butcher shop the next morning with the broken glasses, hands them over the counter and says, I'm a war widow. I can't possibly pay for new glasses every year. Your boy is going to pay for these. And so the, this poor lad um, who was, you know, just doing what boys do uh, is shamed in front of the whole community. But they do become friends and they become quietly left wing together. Uh, Joe and Charles, like a lot of their contemporaries uh, in the 1930s, fall under the spell of this wonderful thing called the Left Book Club. And they, and this is all true, I, I, I base all this on Charles's uh, early diaries. Um, so they devour the poems of Auden as they're published and the books of Isherwood and crucially George Orwell. Um, Joe is totally straight. Charles is distinctly queer, um, but doesn't begin to name that. In fact, re never really names it to himself, even to the end of the book. Um, but Joe is clearly his first big crush. And uh, there's a lot of water in this book, as there is in Kerry's. And there's a crucial scene early on on a perfectly horrible Sunday school picnic to the beach where Joe and Charles wander away from the crowd and Joe discovers that Charles can't swim and gives him his very first proper swimming lesson. And that in turn leads to the two of them spending most of their adolescence and their early 20s when they can swimming in the terrible little um, natural water bath in Launceston which now doesn't exist anymore. But I, I know from Charles's diary that the water was usually green at the start of the swimming season and slimily green by the end. So this is in the days before chlorine or anything like that. Um, uh, water is important, especially uh, as Charles eventually goes uh, uh, into the Navy. And, um, uh, um, uh, but before he does, he, he spends um, time in Plymouth. His, uh, his uh, other friend, uh, Ginger, who's a bit more sort of queer, um, uh, especially in the <laughs> Joe, um, takes him to uh, sort of a Lido in Plymouth. Um, uh, and before we uh, sort of begin to think about transitioning onto the questions part of uh, 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 this event, um, uh, it, it's, a, it's, it's a moment of kind of humour and relief before the kind of horrors of the Second World War came. Yeah. Tell us a little bit about you. Well, again, this is based on something I found in Charles's writing. Charles kept these tiny little diaries. I ruined my eyesight trying to decipher them. I had to use a magnifying glass. Um, and there's one, most of them are very boring. They're about what he ate for supper, what he's seen at the cinema, what he's reading. And they're very, very unemotional. Um, but a current theme that runs all the way through is this friendship with Ginger and these excursions he has with Ginger, and they often go to Plymouth. And Plymouth is like the big city down, it's, it's half an hour away on the train, and it's full on the day of this particular excursion, it is full of sailors. Um, and in the diary, Charles, there's this moment where I just thought, this man cannot be straight, because there's this moment where he describes him and Ginger going up onto Plymouth Hoe, which is the big green park-like area above the sea, above the Lido, and finding themselves surrounded by sunbathing sailors. And Ginger makes Charles sit on the grass with him so they can just enjoy the presence of all these men. And in Charles's diary, he just writes, oh, how I wish that I could draw, underlined, two exclamation marks. And there's no more emotional expression anywhere else in the diaries. I just thought, okay, this guy is gay. He may not know it yet, but he is totally gay. Um, and of course, at that stage, these two young men are still talking rather romantically about the war that may or may not come. And what are you gonna do in the war if you sign up? And Charles decides by the end of that chapter, he's going to be a sailor. But he's having all these fantasies, rather erotic fantasies about helping these hunky sailors to write letters home and things like that. And then of course, the real reality of the war comes home and he does indeed join the Navy, um, but it's not half as romantic as he was thinking. But 
he does, because it's a Gale novel, he does find some romance. Um, he, uh, he, indeed he does. No one um, creates fictional characters who I fall in love with like you do, Patrick. Uh, you oh, have you fallen in love with Christy? Christy, <laughs> oh, I'm, I'm, I will be putty in Christy's hands. I, have <laughs> I um, think there's a cue. <laughs> <laughs> I'm willing to fight. Um, uh, I'm aware, um, I really want to hear from uh, you, the audience, uh, uh, for questions. So please, if you do have um, uh, anything you want to ask our panelists, please do uh, use that uh, question box just below the panel. Um, uh, but before, um, uh, while we're waiting to hear from uh, from you, I did wonder, um, uh, Kerry, SJ, uh, Patrick, do you have any questions for each other? You've uh, you've read each other's books. Um, I'm a, um, I don't want to put you on the spot, but um, uh, Kerry, perhaps, do you, do you have a question for either of the two panelists? I do. Well, I, I, I did write, I did my homework and I wrote one, wrote a couple down and um, I'd love to ask Patrick, I'm, I'm really interested in, I mean, your level of research is unbelievable. Uh, it's just, I find it absolutely fascinating. As you said about, you know, the laundry, you know, I really understand that you really went into, went to town with that and really went into detail. Um, I'm really interested in how you, um, how much you, how you are able to imagine Charles Causley's interior life um, how how far you felt able to go? I think that's what I mean. How far you felt able to go because he's so as much as I understand it from your note at the end, he's so reserved and so private. Is how how far you felt able to take his his queerness, especially. That's a really interesting question. I mean, I I I, I decided I would have to take it all the way, um, but I was really really intimidated. Um, not least because I am one of the patrons of the Charles Causley Trust. So I feel kind of honor bound to, to handle him with care. But funnily enough that I asked the trustees when I was embarking on this book, how, how they felt, because I, I basically said, look, I'm, I'm more or less going to out this national treasure. Um, and they were really eager. They said, please, please, it's out him, out him. And it turns out lots of people who love Charles Causley's poems for ages have been thinking, there's something we're not being told here. It doesn't quite add up. Um, so what I've tried to do in the novel then was to inhabit Charles as faithfully as I could by using the voice of his poems and the voice of his diary, um, but to let him briefly express the things I feel he needs to express and can't quite get out. It's very interesting. Whenever late in life he was asked why he hadn't written his memoirs, he always gave this very dusty answer and just said, oh, it's all in the poems. And mm. it is all in the poems, but my God, you have to decode it quite a bit. Um, anyway. Yeah, we I, do actually have a question from the audience, um, uh, from Tim, Tim O'Reilly. Uh, thank you for your question, Tim. Um, um, and uh, um, please, feel, anyone can take this one. Um, it strikes me that in all three books, the principal characters stand out is very different from those around them. Do you think that is always the case for queer kids and makes life harder for them as they try to find their way? Do you want to take that one, SJ? I was just sure. going to say, please, uh, Kalki is such, a, <laughs> he's such a, a, a moving figure because he, he feels queer even though he's not entirely queer, at least to start with. Um, yeah, I mean, I think we're, you know, in all three books, there's this sort of like queerness is, is infused in the child narrators or the child's perspectives. And it's, you know, not not fully developed yet, especially in, in their in their own self perception, um, which I thought was really interesting across, you know, both of your books as well. That was the case. Um, yeah, I, I mean, I, I think that queer kids are always the odd one out, right? Where you feel a sort of uh, outsider status, um, it, it, not always, obviously, but I, I, I think from even my experience um, has, has always been uh, looking from the outside in and, and feeling yourself at odds with the world in some way. Um, but I don't think that always means that you, you sort of feel isolated. I think that's changing um, for sure. I, I think that, you know, uh, the students that I have now don't feel at all isolated sometimes. They're very like, very comfortable in their queerness in a way that's, that's truly beautiful to see. Um, but don't, but, but uh, yeah. don't, don't, don't you think that so often though with, with 
queer kids, it's it's their straight friends who tell them they're queer first. Um, they often yeah. don't because you they so want to belong. They're not they're not looking. I mean, that's something I found really moving in Kerry's book: the sense that mm -hmm. this child who is gradually finding themselves. Um, even in the second half of the novel, they've they've they've, they've constructed a kind of armor of of mm -hmm. muscle and of toughness. Um, and you feel there's this trembling shell behind that, that, that that's been hidden deep, deep, deep inside. Yeah, and I, I think the thing that was interesting to me in writing Skin was that um, Matty was Matty, who is a gender queer character, is trying to work out who they are without without the the world that we have right now. You know, without social media, without that sort, you yeah. know, queer family no around. Posts. Um, you know, there's a little bit of a, a couple of people that sort of spark some recognition in the second part of the book, but mostly it's sort of trying to work out stuff without the language that we have mm. now. Um, it was only 1999 that the second part is set, but that, that was interesting to me that I felt that there was, a, there was, yeah, a, a sort of protective armour because there's no, there's no way of articulating the way that Matty felt uh, in their gender. Yeah. I really loved that about both your novels is that like, you know, Kelki is is coming of age at a time when all of this uh, he has vocabulary when he grows up. But um, Carrie and yours, you know, Maddie is is you're right, like a uh, uh, gender queer in a world where it's not articulated. The discourse doesn't exist yet. So yeah. what is uh, you know that was really fascinating to see. And Patrick, um, same you know, uh, in terms of sexuality, sort of this this. Um, this, uh, this uh, inability to really like join a large community um, and what what queerness can look like at different points mm -hmm. when when that's the case when there is no when there's no you know discourse into which to walk but the funny thing is of course the irony is that Kalki being born blue um, mm -hmm. it's like this it's like this metaphor I often think you when people say oh, why do you have to come out why do you have to come out and I say well if we were born with blue hair if all queer children had blue hair, everyone would know and you wouldn't have to do it. And in a funny way, his difference is like this, this little metaphor all the way through for being, being queer and out there. And yet there's so much hidden within. Sorry, we should let people ask more questions. I'm <laughs> getting carried away. I think, I think we're beginning to, uh, to kind of get to the end of our allotted time. Um, but before we do, I might just ask you one quick fire question um, uh, each, uh, just to wrap up. I mean, Patrick, not so much yours because we follow the trajectory of Charles kind of further into adulthood as, as he kind of um, uh, engages in the Second World War and beyond. But, um, but childhood is a significant element of your book. Was writing about childhood um, a very conscious kind of like um, de decision for you or in writing the novels? Did, did you particularly want to explore queerness and difference in childhood when you set out to write these books. Um, let's start with you, uh, Kerry. Um, not really. I, I'm not really sure where it came from. I think it was a sort of instinctive decision and I seem to want to write young characters all the time. Uh, I like writing uh, people who are on the cusp of developing into young adulthood or adulthood. There's just something that really appeals to me uh yeah so so not not really I think it was more the the fact of uh you know having a, a dad that suddenly went missing uh you know just at the end of primary school just felt like a really really sort of pertinent pertinent time for that Maybe character. We'll, uh, ask the same question to you Patrick. Yes well I, I knew I was going to write about uh Charles's childhood and um partly because he writes about it so much himself it clearly mattered a great deal to him. Um, but it was partly from Laura's perspective. I, I, I like the idea of writing a character who uh, her, her real motivation in life is to be a mother. Not uh, She's not particularly romantic. I mean, she learns to enjoy sex all too briefly, but um, really her, her selfhood is bound up in, in mothering. So I couldn't escape writing about, about childhood because of Laura. Thank you. And that's uh, uh, yeah, it was sort of similar to, to Carrie. Uh, when Kalki came to me, he just sort of walked in as a 10-year-old boy into my head. And 
and and sort of fully formed, which is very rare. I usually you know build character from the ground up, but Kelki just sort of appeared. Um, and and I knew and and I'm actually not uh, prone to writing younger characters. I, I kind of like that um, sort of late twenties uh, that that sort of angst that comes in your late twenties as you as you figure out how to become an adult. Um, but I think childhood is, especially queer childhood, is such a confusing time and is so rich uh, in terms of narrative potential that that um, it's you know I could I, you one could probably write about queer children forever. Amen. Um, it just uh, leads me to to thank you all, um, uh, uh, audience. If you're home, um, uh, do uh, do give a, a silent applause uh, for Patrick Gale. SJ Cindy and Kerry Andrew. And thank you all so much for joining us. Um, I hugely appreciate your company this evening. Um, uh, just to finish up on behalf of the British Library, um, uh, I'm going to ask you to keep an eye on their What's On page um, on the British Library website for details of more upcoming events. And also, you can watch past events on the British Library player. And there's a dedicated page. Um, on LGBT stories and histories, please do jump onto Gaze the, Web, Web, Gaze the Words website and treat yourself <laughs> and anyone you care about to one all of these amazing novels. Thank you all so much for joining us this evening. Wishing you all well. Thank you. Bye.